This is episode number 141, featuring artist Scott Galatly, and you're going to learn more about paint than you ever knew you needed to know. I found this fascinating. Scott works with Gamblin, especially if you want your paintings to last for future generations. You want to listen to this, but there's so much more. This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plan Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plan Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plan Air. Others say Plain Air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. Thank you, Jim Kipping, and welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. My name is Eric, and if you're listening to this at the time it comes out, this is a bit of a somber week. We're remembering 9-11. Now, I had a close call and frankly would not be here as your host or publisher if things had changed. I had a company in San Francisco. We were trying to raise money. We had a meeting with Dow Jones and the Wall Street Journal at the time and a meeting with the Securities and Exchange Commission. We were meeting in New York at 8.30 in the morning, the morning of 9-11, to have breakfast and then another meeting at 9.30. Then, from those meetings, we were flying off to Minneapolis for another fundraising meeting. Well. Friday before we left, I got a call from the people in Minneapolis who canceled. And quite frankly, I was pretty upset and I got on the phone with the team and I said, should we go to New York anyway or should we just make it one trip and we'll do it all at once? We all decided to make it one trip and do it all at once. Of course, that decision saved our lives. One of the guys we were meeting with had a meeting with that morning at 9.30, died in the towers. So I'm so grateful for God's grace and for getting me a chance to see my kids grow up. They're now seniors in high school. And, of course, becoming a plein air painter, which has changed my life. I love it, and I'm trying to help other people find it because it truly is life-changing. People are really happy when they're plein air painters. So, big news. As you know, I've been driven to teach a million people to paint. But I also had this decision that a million wasn't enough. And so I've been working on a project for the last couple of years, and we're going to be launching a national television show. It's called The Great Outdoor Painting Challenge. Now, I can't tell you too much yet, but it's a reality show where painters will compete each episode for 13 episodes doing plein air painting. And we're casting it now. Maybe you'd like to be on the show. We're filming for three amazing weeks in Italy. Ten painters will be selected, amateurs, pros, and we're selecting judges. And it's going to be a lot of fun. Could make you famous because there's an estimated audience of 20 million people. And I'm going to be the host. We're going to tell you uh, all about this soon. We'll give you more details soon. But if you're interested in the casting, well, go to plenaircasting.com. Take a shot at being on the cast. All kinds of people are welcome in plein air casting, so check it out. Just go look at it. And if you're not registered for the plein air convention yet, get that done too. Sign up because the Scott Christensen pre-convention workshop is going to be sold out before we know it, and the Thomas Schaller pre-convention watercolor workshop is going to be sold out before we know it. Two masters you want to get in there. And, of course, the convention, of course, will also be sold out. So get that done at pleinairconvention.com. Coming up after the interview, I'll be answering some art marketing questions in the Marketing Minute. Let's get right to the interview with Scott Galatly, who is a brilliant artist in his own right, but also a product manager for Gamblin Paints. Scott Galatly, welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. Thank you, Eric. Man, I am looking forward to this. Good. Me too. So you and I met, I'm trying to think about when we met for the first time, but I think it had to do with Gamblin paint because you've been there for a long time i've been there since 2004 and i suspect the first time we met was likely the first plein air conference in red rocks 
Well, that could be. So that's been about eight or nine, eight years ago. Um, I, you know, I started Plein Air Magazine in 2004. So I don't know. I don't think I actually came and visited uh, you guys then. So for everybody's benefit, um, tell, tell us a little bit about your role at Gamblin, but also your uh, personal painting path. Sure, absolutely. Um, my painting path started um, as a as a kid, mostly um, in the teenage years, drawing and painting. I went to the University of Oregon where I studied painting. I graduated there in um, 1997 and went to work in the art material industry. Um, first at a supply store here in Portland, where I'm originally from, then on to Seattle. And it was through those stores that I had gotten to know Robert Gamblin and Gamblin Artist Colors. Um, I first started working with Robert in 2004 as kind of a part-time role, um, helping him at um, industry events, but also in communicating uh, with painters um, on a daily basis, answering their technical questions about materials and techniques um, as it relates to uh, Gamblin's materials. And that started on a part-time basis in 2004, and then it ramped up to a full-time um, role in 2005. Um, since then, I have a small team of um, painter support um, that continue the work of um, answering painters' questions, and then my personal role has moved in more the direction of product development with Gamblin. So, what's that like? What What do you do in product development? Um, mostly, it is working on um, new products, um, new colors to the the Gamblin palette. Uh, new painting mediums, um, looking at uh, ways for um, continuously improving the um, formulation and performance of our materials, um, as well as looking after kind of day-to-day -day, uh, quality assurance. So I, I don't know a whole lot about making paint, but um, I, I, I would assume that kind of all paint is made about the same way you know some probably grind it thinner some grind it thicker some use different oils so how do you how do you possibly figure out how to improve performance and what is performance from your perspective well one of the analogies that uh, bob shared with me um, early on which i've always appreciated is that um, oil colors by nature um, is a is a fairly simple recipe of dry pigment bound in a drying oil, most commonly linseed oil. And the analogy that he used, it's like a uh, if you go into a row of Italian restaurants and they all have a pasta carbonara, and um, you go from one restaurant to another, tasting these over the course of a week, and you might find that one restaurant just does it a little bit better than anyone else. Uh, they're all very delicious, but then it comes, just comes down to personal taste. So when a painter reaches for a tube of gambling ultramarine blue or uh, cadmium red light, they're basically experiencing our vision for that color. And that might be a particular um, choice of pigment that we use um, to make that paint, but it also is the, the textural uh, qualities as well. So the amount of oil that's added to the paint not only influences the texture, but also the saturation of that pigment. And so what we experience when we squeeze out a tube is that manufacturer's vision for any one particular color. Um, 
And what's what's been really kind of exciting with with my role with Gamblin is that um, not only do I kind of look after the the long term aging qualities and some of the testing of the materials, but also um, uh, look at new possibilities uh, for colors to be added into, into the line and, and what that means for uh, new possibilities for painters as well. So you and I have a little bit of experience because we talked about a couple of new colors that had actually been invented recently in the last couple of years. Uh, one was um, a new blue and uh, you guys bought a small amount of pigment at a very high price, I guess because it's so <laughs> rare. And uh, you made up a couple of tubes and I think they were equivalent of about a thousand dollars a tube or some such thing. Um, t- talk to me about that. I-, I know you're not producing it, so it's probably irrelevant, but I thought it was interesting to see what, what kind of a decision process you go through uh, when something new is invented. And I would imagine new colors don't get invented very often. That That's correct. Um, this particular example with the blue was um, invented down um, in Corvallis, Oregon. So it was a nice local um, tie-in to us being up in Portland. And it was a professor and scientist in the materials research department at Oregon State University. And he was looking at compounds of metals um, for semiconductor uses in electronics. And this was a um, compound of the metals um, yttrium, indium, and manganese that he um, fused together at incredibly high heat. And much to his surprise, it came out um, as a blue compound. And he um, invented this uh, blue pigment um, as a result. So those three metals um, basically gave the name of, of yin min blue. Um, taking those um, chemical names and piecing them together to form uh, that compound. Um, It was really interesting. It got a lot of press. Um, I did obtain a sample of the pigment. And um, to your point, it was very expensive. And we have to kind of weigh at that point, does it really impact a painter's palette in a meaningful way that um, validates the cost of it. And for us, that answer was, was no, that it didn't. Um, I found pretty quickly that a combination of cobalt blue and ultramarine blue mimicked the mass tone of yin min blue quite well, um, but was also a little stronger um, in its tints and its mixtures than, than yin min blue was that kind of grayed out um, significantly when you add white to it. Uh, So um, that, and it was a very kind of difficult pigment to work with because of its uh, large particle size. Um, It yielded a texture that was not too satisfying to paint with. Uh, So um, I think those were the the decisions that we talked through that, really kind of prevented us from pursuing that as a pigment. So there, there, uh, there are technological developments from time to time. And, and for instance, if I correct me if I'm wrong, cause I probably don't know what I'm talking about, but you have, uh, there are times in history when new kinds of pigments are invented like the, I think the phthalo colors maybe, or the quinacridone, I'm probably saying it wrong. Uh, am, am I right about those? I mean, weren't those something that in the last maybe 25 or 50 years were were kind of invented? Or Well, those color names that give us those real tongue twisting of color names on the tube um, are in a family of pigments called modern organics. And they have their foundation like in, chemi- in or- organic chemistry uh, based on carbon. So instead of being made from metals or compounds of metals, they are made in laboratory settings um, and they contain 
carbon in their molecular structure. Um, so they give us these names like quinacridone, dioxazine, thalocyanine, and they behave very differently than mineral colors do. And I think that those differences are really fascinating to the artists. And uh, one of the great attributes of them is when you mix them with white or with other modern organics, they retain their high chroma in their tints and their mixtures. So um, it really expands the, um, the kind of color palette for artists. So do you anticipate uh, that technology, because we have access to so much better technology today, do you think that this will result in new forms of pigments or, or possibly even colors that we don't know appear on the spectrum that could, could emerge? Well, I, I think so, and I certainly hope so. Okay. And if we look back at the, ne at the last 200 years of painting or more, um, artists have always worked within the confines of the materials. If, it, if we go back tens of thousands of years, uh, the central palette to, um, to artists' use was you know, burnt bone for black, natural uh, whitings uh, for white, and earth colors, yellows um, in, the, in the form of ochres, um, reds in the form of, of siennas, uh, browns, umbers. If you look at the, the palette of cave paintings, it's basically um, black, white, and red. And when we go from that point on thousands of years through um, the era of classical painting, the palette did not change that much, mostly dominated still by earth colors. Um, if you look at the best um, examples of classical painting through the Renaissance, uh, you had um, uh, Leonardo, you had Michelangelo, you have uh, Titian, uh, you have Rembrandt, uh, and mostly working within a fairly muted color palette. I think um, Titian being the main um, exception of, of those that I listed because of his um, locale there in in Venice, which right. was the main kind of color center of the Renaissance. And that was mostly because of um, it, it being an exporting and importing hub for the rest of, of Europe and the East. Um, so the classical palette was really dominated by earth colors, um, semi-precious metals. Uh, I think of lapis being the most um, kind of storied pigment of the classical era that gave us ultramarine blue. Um, and you have from the classical palette to the industrial revolution, when um, the palette became much broader with the cadmiums, cobalts, chromiums, um, ultramarine blue was then synthesized in the early 19th century. It basically um, gave the impressionists a brighter, more opaque colors, uh, palette of colors to work with that were, that was essentially born from the industrial revolution that expanded painters access to color space. And then with the development of modern organics that I discussed earlier, you have again, an expansion of, of color space. So um, I certainly hope that as new technologies um, develop and give us more um, durable pigments to work with as painters, that color space will continue to be expanded and give us more, um, more possibilities um, in our in our color mixing systems. You know, there, there's a trend among some painters who want to paint utilizing the old materials of the past 
Um, yep. Uh, you have uh, you have some people like Dan Graves in in uh, Florence at the Florence Academy who's grinding his own pigments, making his own paints uh, as a result of that. Um, you have uh, you have others who are um, buying uh, older materials, but I wonder about the the light fastness. And I know that a lot of these paintings have lasted, and I know that you know you, you can look at the Mona Lisa and it's in beautiful shape. Um, but are there issues with certain types of paints? For instance, the old Elysian crimson. Um, would would have light fastness issues, and I think asphaltum may have as well. Asphaltum was heavily used in the in the uh, I don't know 18th century, I suppose. Can you talk to those? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's been a number of pigments that have essentially been made obsolete uh, for one reason or another. Um, stability is certainly. Um, one main reason. Um, asphaltum was a, a really interesting um, pigment because it actually was a, a, a tar-based material rather than being a, a, a true pigment bound in oil. Right. And it was um, used as kind of a, a glaze in oil paintings. Um, it was also still commonly used um, in printmaking techniques. Um, so when you see asphaltum in uh, contemporary brands, um, that name has stayed with us, just like the name Indian yellow has stayed with us, sap green has stayed with us, Van Dyke brown. Um, and more often than not, those colors now are um, made by um, mixtures of, of light fast pigments. So for instance, Gamblin asphaltum is a mixture of um, ivory black and transparent with red. Uh, sap green, which used to be made from berries, what is a mixture of Indian yellow and phthalo blue. Um, so oftentimes these names will come through history and uh, still be relevant today, even though the composition of those colors have changed because of the lack of stability um, from those original um, color sources. Um, alizarin crimson is, is one that is still uh, popular in uh, painters' palettes. And we have a permanent version that we call alizarin permanent using a, a modern organic pigment called anthraquinone and that is a touch lighter in um, value than um, alizarin crimson but it's a beautiful cool red with a really high tinting strength um, with the modern organics um, some of them have excellent light fastness Others um, within the, the ASTM, American Society of Testing Materials, uh, with their standard for uh, pigments and light fastness, has a excellent or very good light fastness rating on it. Um, so there is a standard for that that manufacturers can use and then communicate uh, this quality of standard to the to the painter um we also at gamblin um do internal um and independent light fastness testing um so i'm looking at a number of pigments that uh, we haven't even incorporated into our line yet and one of the first things that i look at is um how they fare in our internal light fastness now there, uh, I, I remember reading some old um, books written in the 1800s that would talk about the sin of mixing certain colors together because of chemical reactions. Does that occur today? Is that still an issue with any any forms of paint? I, I seem to remember it was something that was copper based, uh, and if you put that together with lead or some other such thing, you'd have. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you'd die. <laughs> right, right. Uh, yeah, that was most 
I think, famously um, cautioned for the use of their degree, which was a um, essentially a copper-based um, blue-green that was um, had would essentially turn black in paintings. And it was uh, through a chemical reaction with uh, lead-based pigments. Um, Verdigris basically became obsolete uh, once uh, Viridian was developed in the 19th century. Uh, those such um, chemical reactions thankfully do not happen um, with contemporary pigments that um, manufacturers um, make available today. So um, thankfully, that's one issue that's largely been left in the past. So uh, let me skip forward to kind of a slightly different topic. If I want to make sure that if I care about my paintings and having them last so that they look as good as new uh, from when they were painted uh, 500 years from now, or more, what should I do or what should I avoid? Um, at risk of sounding like a kind of a snarky answer, my first suggestion was make great paintings. And that, that was pretty snarky. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the reason I say that it's not, it's not to be snarky. It's, um, because we as a culture take care of the paintings that are valuable to us. Right. We put them in museums. And we, we put them in museums. We care for them. Um, we provide money to, um, for their long-term restoration and conservation. Um, and, you know, we, do that with paintings that um, we as a culture have kind of deemed valuable, um, no matter what the craftsmanship was to begin with. So um, having said that, and I think you bring up a really great um, example and a great uh, trend with this kind of return to, um, you'd mentioned traditional palettes, um, in my view, I think it's a, a great trend back towards the craftsmanship of oil painting. And this is one area where we consult with painters on a daily basis is we spend a lot of our energy and a lot of our um, talents and emotions into creating artwork. And we do want them to last. Um, after all, all of the ideas, emotions, um, effort that we put into our work when we're done with it only exists in the materials. And we want that statement to live in the world as long as possible, especially if um, our work is being valued either through, um, through our family, through collectors, and, you know, ultimately and hopefully, um, by our culture. So I think it's a great um, development that we're seeing is, is painters that are really interested in, in diving into the craftsmanship of the materials. Um, just a few things about making um, oil paintings that are going to last. Um, I'm a firm kind of um, believer that paintings should be done on rigid supports rather than flexible ones. Uh, so panels rather than canvas. And a lot of the um, cracking that happens with oil painters, with oil paintings over time, um, is basically through the movement of the substrate. And that transfers that stress onto the paint layers above. And when oil paintings are done on a rigid support that really mitigates the overall movement of the painting structure. And that goes a long way in preventing um, a lot of the cracking that can happen over time. Also, you're not likely to get as, get punctures 
you know, damaged True. or moving True. or somebody leaning it against something. Yeah, absolutely. And I've, you know, heard horror stories over the years of, you know, um, a painting that um, inadvertently moved or fell and it got dented. If worse, um, worst case, it got, it got torn or ripped um, with a panel um, that protects the painting structure a bit more than so, on a fabric support. Yeah, yeah. So the, the material though on that panel and what's on that material matters a lot. I remember hearing a story about a lawsuit where Odd Nerdrum uh, had a, had paintings. I don't know if this is true. So I, it, I, don't, I apologize to him if he's listening, but you hear these stories about how he had a painting that, that slid off of the canvas because it was over a radiator because it had been primed with acrylic house paint or something. And I remember Ken Oster used to talk about how he'd just go to the, the hardware store and buy a, uh, you know, uh, house paint that of any color and he'd just mix them all together and get a gray and prime his panels with those. And I, I was, I love Ken, but I was horrified by that thought. Do you have any thoughts on what's right or wrong in terms of what you put underneath your oil paint? Yeah. I mean, that's like building a beautiful house on a foundation, on a poor foundation. And, you know, we, I mentioned the support a moment ago is, is what is that physical material that we're painting on um, how we prime or, or what we choose as a ground on top of that is, just as important um and there are absorbent grounds that um, painters choose to paint on there are uh, less absorbent grounds i think the main common um thread through either type of ground is that it has a balanced um, um absorbency so it can but allow the paint to kind of um, be pulled into it, but also a subtle tooth on the surface. And that tooth is really important to provide a, a mechanical bond. Um, if think about a nice matte ground to paint on, that matte surface is, is visually created by the physical tooth that the ground has been uh, formulated with. And with that tooth, it just um, increases the surface area for which paint layers to adhere to. So would that um, mean that the, the, the more pr pronounced the tooth, the more likely the painting is going to continue to be bonded? Correct. So you look at correct. some of these old Russian paintings that, you know, the tooth is very wide and it's almost like burlap. Exactly, exactly. So um, that's one of the great things about that fabric. It just has quite a bit of surface area uh, to to grab paint with. Um, again, coming back to uh, a panel is that you'd want to uh, provide a, a ground on the surface of that that has a um you know a, a subtle tooth so i personally in my own work really like painting on a, a smooth panel but i make sure to prime that panel with a ground um it's an alkyd based ground that i use um that dries to a nice um toothy surface to really grab the paint to ensure adhesion um, so whether it's fabric or panel there's things painters can do to um, ensure that that bond is being created. Um, the issue with some house paints um, or house primers is that the pigment to binder ratio is going to be much different um, uh, because of that different intention and of the manufacturing. Um, so if it's a very binder rich uh, formula, that's being used as a ground, 
that minimizes that matte surface and that tooth. So oil paints will have a harder time to, to make a long-term adhesion. And, and what about, uh, you, you know, back in the Renaissance era, there were painters who would paint directly on wood panels. Um, what are your thoughts on painting directly on wood? Um, again, I think most of those were generally sealed. Um, and, you know, since even before oil paintings were, since oil painting became the dominant uh, medium in, in Western art, a tempera was used before that. And uh, the traditional gesso, um, gesso, the term comes to us, uh, which is Italian for gypsum, which is the main component of traditional uh, gesso grounds. Um, that was applied to panels and it's a highly absorbent surface and it was not only a, a beautiful ground for egg tempera, but then um, for oil paintings as well after that. Um, sealing wood is, um, is an important aspect. Um, the way I like to um, talk about this is that it's a little bit different in sealing fabric, um, like uh, cotton and linen. Um, with sealing fabric, you want to protect the fabric from the paint wires. When sealing wood, it's more consideration of um, protecting the paint layers from the wood. Um, so a wood panel is going to have natural resins in it um, that protect the wood quite well. Um, but you don't want any of those colorants to, to kind of come through into those paint layers. Um, so st still sealing the wood um, is a really uh, useful um, technique. Uh, I think this was traditionally done with, you know, resins and oils. Um, today there's you know, temporary um, sealers for wood. Um, I usually use one of our alkyd mediums and thin it down a bit and uh, seal the wood that way before applying the ground. Um, the other benefit to sealing the wood is that it reduces the absorbency. So sealing the back is just as important as sealing the front um, because over the life of the painting, you want to prevent that moisture from the atmosphere coming into contact warping. with the wood panel and prevent warping exactly yeah so one it's, of the other benefits i would think of of uh, uh, of using a a um, linen or a cotton and, and we'll talk about that in a second is that if it's ground well it can be peeled off of a panel and remounted on another panel assuming the substrate that it's mounted on is going bad or rotting or something like that yeah, yeah. And um, paintings are often, paintings that are done on fabric um, are often relined. And um, where a auxiliary fabric support um, is created and then the old um, fabric support is essentially mounted on top of that. And um, it's really pretty amazing work um, that the world of, of painting conservation does to restore, you know, really large works on, on old, old fabric. Mm -hmm. It's that work is really quite amazing. So uh, I don't want to belabor the protecting paintings thing too much longer. So in terms of applying paint, are you pretty much recommending, uh, um, a fat over lean, th you know, thin, thin underpainting and then building on top of that? Yes. Um, however, I think painters can overthink fat over lean <laughs> too much. Um, you know, fat over lean, I think it's really best described as flexible over less flexible. And essentially, if you've got 
you know, the, the oil in the binder is what gives it the painted flexibility. And if you uh, thin that paint in the initial stages of the painting process, um, applying paint directly to the ground, um, either using just a small amount of solvent or solvent that's been mixed with additional binder, like an alkyd medium or a little bit of oil, which still makes a nice, really fluid material for underpainting, um, but there's dangers in adding too much solvent in the early stages of the painting um, because you're decreasing the amount of binder in the paint. So that um, would be painting like watercolor? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and so if, if what you add to the paint is a mixture of binder and a thinner, uh, you can still get a nice, real fluid consistency with the paint for those early uh, stages of, of the painting, um, but there's still enough binder to maintain that, that uh, integrity of the paint film. Um, and then as you go up through the painting structure, um, adding a bit more binder with each subsequent layer is going to increase its flexibility. Um, so you get a painting structure that is, um, again, flexible over less flexible in its makeup. Um, I think the main thing, though, is what I tell artists all the time. Um, try to avoid extremes going from a real flexible layer to a real lean layer or a real lean layer jumping right to a real flexible or, or oil rich layer right away. If you stay within that kind of middle area of the spectrum, pretty much paint out of the tube and or modified a little bit with a medium, you're going to be in great shape. Um, I also really remind painters that this is a creative endeavor and you have to get into the flow of the painting process. You have to create the type of mark that the painting dictates that's created there. And that could be a, a wet mark with painting medium. That could be a dry mark painting out of a tube. Um, the most important thing is that you make the work that you, um, that really supports your artistic vision. And as long as you're kind of avoiding those extremes, I wouldn't lose a lot of sleep over the fat over lean, mm -hmm. um, especially if you're, you know, painting on panel. That's a nice, sturdy uh, support. Okay. So next subject is about varnishing. Uh, okay. I, you know, there's a lot of information out there. It's hard to know what's true, what's not. Uh, you know, I was always taught that you let your painting dry for a year before, or at least six months before you ever varnish it. I've heard that you can varnish with your, um, your Gamvar varnish pretty quickly. And of course, those of us who do shows and those of us who are out there, uh, you know, turning things around rapidly, uh, you want to be able, you don't want the, the consumer that's buying it off the, off the easel or, you know, or at a, at a plein air show to have to varnish it a year later. What's the real story? Well, I'm glad you asked about that because um, there's been a lot of changes in the world of varnishing. Um, that first off, let me just kind of address, you know, why we varnish. Um, why are we even talking about this with oil paintings? Um, varnishing really satisfies two main concerns in um, for finished oil paintings. One is an aesthetic concern, is that it tends to unify the surface area of the painting. Um, different oil colors dry require different amounts of oil in their paint making process. Uh, some colors naturally dry glossy, other colors naturally dry more matte. If you include a painting medium into your painting process, uh, like I mentioned a moment ago, you might have some areas where you use more medium, some areas where you use less medium. That can all contribute to 
a finished painting that has an uneven surface quality when it's done. And this is just one of those natural um, components of, of oil painting. So the first kind of concern of varnishing is an aesthetic one to even out that surface quality. Whether the painter wants a gloss surface, a satin surface, an even matte finish, uh, a varnish will satisfy that aesthetic um, concern. The other aspect is um, the protection of the paint layers themselves. Um, oil paintings and most paintings in general will dry to a fairly um, porous or receptive um, surface if left unvarnished. And so the varnish is basically a way to seal off the paintings, the painting structure from the painting's environment. And a varnish is essentially a you know, clear, protective, removable coating. And that removable aspect of a varnish is a really important one because, you know, the topmost layer of any painting is going to be some dust and some dirt. Uh, thankfully, our home environments are much cleaner now than they were 100 and 150 years ago. Um, but the topmost layer is going to be some dirt and dust. So a varnish layer protects that paint layer from the dust and the dirt. And depending on the kind of level of accumulation over the life of the painting, if need be, a varnish layer can simply be removed with all of the dust and dirt that's accumulated on top of it and then a fresh varnish can be applied. Now, in terms of what has been used as a varnish over time, um, it was, painting varnishes were basically dominated by natural resins, uh, Damar being the most common. And Damar varnish, it's a very, um, it's a, kind of a hard resin varnish. It uh, requires turpentine for dissolving the varnish. Um, so all, res all varnishes start as a dry resin and that resin is dissolved in a solvent. In the case of Damar, it's turpentine. That makes a fluid varnish. The varnish is brushed on, the solvent evaporates, and then what's left is it's return to a solid uh, varnish layer. And one of the, um, a few of the disadvantages of traditional Damar varnish, one is that it was based, that it requires this strong solvent like turpentine for its uh, formulation of the varnish and its subsequent removal off of the painting. Um, but also Damar, is a very brittle material. And that brittleness is what led it to the um, rule of thumb of waiting six months to a year before applying the varnish. So as the, the paint layers underneath continue to oxidize, there is a slight expansion and contraction because of the uptake of oxygen. And if you prematurely applied a brittle varnish layer over the top, it wouldn't be able to withstand the movement of the paint layer underneath and it would crack the varnish layer. So that six to 12 months really came out of some of the disadvantages of Damar varnish. Um, the Gamvar picture varnish that we make available uh, is a varnish that <clears throat> was developed in cooperation with the Conservation Science Department um, at the National Gallery. And uh, Gamvar um, hit the market around the early to mid 90s. And it is a clear resin. Um, 
And what's special about it is that instead of being dissolved in a strong solvent like turpentine or turpentine, rather, um, the gamvar can be dissolved with a very mild solvent like gamsol, which has a much lower solvency or solvent power than turpentine. So um, there's not only is it dissolved with a mild solvent, but it's also subsequently removable with this mild solvent. Um, also, gamvar is inherently a more flexible material than damar varnish. So it's not going to um, crack if it's applied before um, that six to 12 month um, time frame. So how soon can um, I apply it? Our recommendation is um, that you find the thickest area of, of paint on your painting and just touch it and gently press into it. If it feels dry and hard throughout, you can varnish the painting. Okay. Now that could be um, a matter of weeks if it's a thin painting with fast drying materials. Um, however, if you use a lot of alizarin crimson and um, a slow drying oil and paint with a spatula, it could be years. <laughs> so <laughs> it ultimately, we really try to put it into um, the hands of the artist to, to really think about how that work was created and as far as the best answers as when it can be varnished. Um, I personally, you know, know myself really well as a painter. I know how I work. I know which materials I work with. Um, and I usually varnish my paintings in about four to six weeks because they, you know, kind of satisfy that requirement of being uh, dry and hard in mm -hmm. their thickest layers. All right. So I've got a bunch of other questions and I'm, I'm going to try to fast track this because we don't have a lot of time left, but um, there are lots of questions about solvents. Uh, Gamsol is obviously a very popular solvent is probably one of the most popular out there. Um, and one of the reasons is because it is quote unquote odorless. Um, odorless does not necessarily mean that you're not still getting fumes. What, what is the story? Is, is it safe to breathe this stuff? What should the environment be like if you're painting indoors or outdoors? I guess outdoors doesn't matter. Um, what is your official line on this? Well, <clears throat> Gamsol is um, <clears throat> what's called an aliphatic um, solvent. And uh, petroleum distillates can be um, made into a number of different solvents. And there's essentially two categories within those, within those types of solvents. There's aromatic, which are the types of solvents that you can smell, and then aliphatic solvents, which are essentially odorless. Um, within those aromatic solvents, those aromatic components are the parts of the solvent that are evaporating off that are harmful to, for humans to work around. Aliphatic solvents have been have such a high kind of boiling range and processing temperature that all of those aromatic components are removed. So because you cannot smell it, does mean it's safer for you. Um, still within that, you, you look at the permissible exposure level of these materials and um, we actually have developed a, a, a case study um, that is on the Gamblin website, uh, gamblincolors.com in the studio safety section. And it's essentially looking at that permissible exposure level 
which is rated in um, milligrams per metered squared of the working environment um, that GAMP solves it in. And um, I would direct the listeners to go to um, the Studio Safety Guide for Schools on our website and look at that case study. Um, and the key point there is that it would take an exorbitant amount of Gamsol evaporated into a working space to get even close to that permissible exposure level. Okay. Now, the other issue is we're hearing a lot of stories about uh, some materials might be more dangerous than others. Uh, the one that comes to mind is, of course, lead and cadmium. Um, there's rumor that, I th well, it may not be rumor, I think in certain parts of Europe, maybe cadmium colors are not even allowed to be sold anymore. Uh, because they don't want it in the water system. What What's the future of this? Uh, is it safe to use CADs? What's your opinion on that? Another great question. Um, there was a proposed ban of artist use of CAD pigments that came out of um, Sweden, I believe, a number of years ago. And... Um, that legislation in Europe um, did not proceed, so it didn't go anywhere. Um, but essentially, what they found was that cadmium-based pigments from artist's use was being flushed down the drain, um, and it was being found in trace amounts in agricultural settings uh, because essentially the solids being um, sent down the drain were converted into fertilizer use, which was then uh, used on fields. Um, well, for one, um, you know, this is not an oil painting related issue. Um, oil painters um, <clears throat> do not pour pigments down the drain. Um, so I think that, you know, just uh, uh, thinking about the um, how we dispose of waste in our studios is um, really kind of an important consideration for, for all painters. Um, thankfully, with the slow drying times of, of oil paints, uh, a lot of the waste that is created by the oil painting process can be repurposed right back into the painting process. And that could be, um, you know, taking the colors from your palette at the end of the painting session, mixing them all together, um, putting them in an empty tube or under saran wrap and saving that um, mixture of mud for, um, for underpainting or for painting frames. Um, I'll use this technique to paint the edges of my panels um, in my own studio. So, um, but to get back to the, the question of, of cadmiums, um, cadmiums pigments, we call them cadmium pigments for short, but they are actually compounds of different metals in the case of uh, the cadmium pigments that we use, it's cadmium, sulfur, and zinc, or cadmium, sulfur, and selenium that give us the range from the cool yellows to the deep reds. Once you fuse cadmium with those other metals, the toxicity concerns of straight cadmium are drastically reduced, if not nullified completely. And what's changed over the course of cadmium production over the over the last few decades is that we have cadmium pigments um, from decades ago that were soluble in the human digestive system to a shift where cadmium pigments that are produced and being used today are insoluble in the human digestive system. So if we think about the routes of entry into our 
um, into our system, you know, we are not exposed to cadmium pigments um, through inhalation. Those pigments are bound in the, the linseed oil binder. Um, so, so that if you were mixing ingest- your own, if you were mixing powdered cadmiums, it'd be a different story. Then you want to um, treat those with care and use a proper um, respirator when using cadmium pigments um, because they are harmful through inhalation when using the dry pigments. And we actually just recommend for anyone using dry pigments that you know you treat those with the same level of care um, because of the small particle size. Even um, pigments that are um, you know not harmful to us in the way that um, dry cadmium pigments are, uh, you, they still are a respiratory irritant and you want to protect yourself um, with that. And that's just a good practice. Um, anytime you're working with dry pigment is to wear a, a respirator. Um, but cadmium pigments um, are safe to paint with. Um, and, you know, oil paints in general, um, you know, will not, um, you know, penetrate healthy, unbroken skin. So um, if you get paint on your hands, you can wash it off with soap and water. Um, it's not a concern. Uh, cadmium pigments are safe to paint with. And the particular um, manufacturer that we work with that makes cadmium pigments um, has an extremely high standard for um, safety in environments and, and uses um, to, the, to the end end user and consumer. Um, Cadmiums are fabulous colors and it would be, um, you know, it's, they have a strength and opacity and color saturation that um, are really invaluable to painters. Okay. Terrific. Well, um, you know, Scott, one of the, we're kind of, on the edge of our time now, and one of the things I wanted to talk about is your own your own walk as a plein air painter, uh, because you're a fabulous painter, and you obviously you have this this great gig with Gamblin, but you also are are doing a lot of painting. Tell us briefly about that and um, how that all kind of began for you. Oh, let's see. I've been <clears throat> um, oil painting for about 25 years now. Um, I took some of my early oil painting classes in college um, in the early 90s and um, continued that all the way through um, college and after. And I've been plein air painting um, quite a bit ever since. Um, I've always really loved... um, <clears throat> landscape based abstraction. I think that there's a great um, kind of symbiotic relationship between abstract painting and um, the source of landscape within um, within that. Um, painters like Deben Korn and Wolf Kahn, um, mm-hmm. Joan Mitchell come to mind of, of um, painters that are very expressionistic, but um, their imagery is rooted in their connection to the landscape. And so those are the the painters that I'm drawn towards. And um, in my own work, a lot of my studio work comes from um, my, my painting outside. And lately, in the last year or so, um, my time to go out and spend two or three hours developing a painting out in the field, um, that opportunity has become quite limited. Um, So I've kind of filled that artistic void by going out and doing um, 
smaller, faster watercolor and gouache studies and keeping all of my plein air paintings essentially in, in sketchbooks. And um, I've just absolutely loved this process um, because if I have an hour between, uh, you know, for example, leaving work and going to pick up a kid, um, I can go out and make a quick painting. And so it fits into my life really well. And I also really love the process of taking those small paintings from that's made by using a very different medium and translating that into um, my studio oil paintings. Um, one of the process of, of working both in plein air and in the studio that um, I've never been satisfied with is just making larger oil paintings of my plein air paintings. Um, this process works really well for a lot of painters and there's painters that do a fabulous job with it. Um, but I have always wanted the studio work to take on kind of a life of its own. And I will often develop studio work that's a composite of multiple paintings done out in the field. Mm -hmm. um, so this practice of, of making multiple small quicks um, paintings with watercolors and gouache um, has really energized um, and informed my, my recent studio work. I think a lot of people are starting to turn towards squash. I'm hearing a lot more about it than I ever have. I think so too. I think it's, um, it's a really beautiful, um, beautiful medium. And I think there's a great parallel to, um, to oil painting with that um, because of its inherent gouache's inherent opacity. And that's why I came to it as well. Um, my oil color palette, has evolved over the years, um, but it's a very conscious kind of balance between um, mineral opaque colors and modern transparent colors. And so I really kind of balance opacity and transparency in my oil paintings. And with the combination of watercolors and gouache, I can mimic that in the, the water meat that I, that I use out in the field. Now, I, I'm just going to ask you a question because I, I don't want to get you fired or anything, but you guys only make oil paint. You don't make wash or watercolor, do you? Uh, no, we don't. So we don't. you're talking about a medium. And, and by the way, you don't need Gamsol if you're using gouache. So you're, you're out of there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's given me just a really great, um, appreciation for for other mediums and um you know this isn't this isn't new i mean uh robert gamblin does a lot of his field work and, and sketches and ideas in dry pastel and he loves the um the relationship with dry pastel to his oil paintings and i'm kind of doing the same thing with uh the water media to my oil paintings. well one thing i love so. about you guys and love about your company is that you, you know, it's not just all about you. And uh, knowing Robert, um, he, you know, he, he's a true artist and he really, really deeply cares about people. And I know he wouldn't have a, a bit of a problem with somebody using another medium or another problem, you know, another paint or anything else. And I know he, he feels he'll get his fair share and everything else is okay. Yeah, I've always appreciated that aspect of um, the tone in which which Bob um, spoke to painters. And this was really influential um, coming out of college was it was this great reference for materials, the history of materials, the um, use of materials and craftsmanship in a painting. Um, but it was the tone in which um, 
I read this information back in the day from Gamblin was very much painter to painter. It was um, information that was really born out of um, the process of painting and put within the context of painting. And that's something as I um, continue to write newsletters and um, give lecture demonstrations across the country with um, that, and I've, I have a team of really terrific painters um, that are that do this work with me. Um, there's great information that we want to share, but it's all the tone is very much painter to painter, and we view at the utmost importance in this communication. What does the painter that we're talking to? What is his artistic and his or her artistic vision or intention, and what can we do to support that and really shorten that dif- distance between their intention and the results that they get? Well, and I think one one thing that is also wonderful is that uh, I've watched you and others interact with other paint manufacturers at the plein air convention, and you're all friends. You all kind of take care of each other and, and, and everybody kind of takes their, their, their share and their piece, but there's not this angry, vicious competition that you see in so many industries. I think everybody has the, you know, the care of the painters in mind and everybody's got a really nice spirit about it. And I think you guys are, are great to have the spirit that you have. Scott, it's been terrific having you on the Plein Air podcast today. It's been very enjoyable for me as well. I really appreciate the opportunity. And we will see you at the Plein Air Convention in Denver. That sounds great. I'm looking forward to it. If not sooner. Actually, Absolutely. I'll probably see you at the, at the FACE conference. I hope so. Yep. I hope so. Thank you again to Scott Galatly and to Gamblin for all they do for the industry. Now let's do some marketing stuff. This is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art, Proven Techniques to Turn Your Passion into Profit. In the Marketing Minute, I try to answer your marketing questions, and you can email those to me, eric at plenairmagazine.com. Here's a question from Crafts Art Camp. They say, how do you find the right buyer and how do you price work without feeling regretful? Well, there's two very different questions. First, everyone tends to get hung up on big audiences, but big isn't necessarily what you want or need. To find the right buyer, you need someone who has a concentrated audience of buyers, meaning art buyers in your case, people who love art, people who have a history of buying art. For instance, my magazine, Fine Art Connoisseur, has over 300 billionaires who read it. And that's, of course, just scratching the surface. And these are people who happen to love art, happen to buy the kind of art that you do. And, of course, they're obsessive about art like we are. So finding the right place to advertise is really critical. That's essentially how you solve that problem, finding the right buyer. Okay. Now, the other question... I'm not so sure exactly how to answer that other question. You said, in terms of pricing without feeling regretful. I'm not sure what that means. Regretful that you didn't charge enough? Regretful that it was not more affordable for others? What does regretful mean? So I'm, I'm kind of going to take a guess at it. Um, I have a theory. A stored painting makes no money. Unless it's something I really want to keep for my personal collection, I'd rather get something out of it than letting it sit. A painting might help me pay for art materials or something else. So there are times to let it sit. For instance, if you're building a body of work for a gallery show, you want to let it sit so that you can build up that gallery show. But paintings need homes. Most artists tend to underprice their works and and price themselves out of business. In other words, if you're selling it for too little, you're probably not getting what you need out of it because your expenses are probably higher than you know they are. But starting out high isn't always an option either with a strong brand. Now, the bigger the brand, the bigger the value in the eyes of the collector, 
then you can get higher prices, like Scott Christensen can command about any price he wants, so can Clyde Aspavig, because they are in high demand and they get great awards in these big shows. And so I think that's where we ultimately want to be. But that takes some time, it takes exceptional painting, and it takes extensive marketing and branding. You have to become a well-known brand. Now, there's a lot of different ways we can do that, but that's what it really takes. And then you command big prices. But even those people probably got started out selling at lower prices when they were unknown and their work wasn't as sophisticated. So you've got to be thinking about, you know, get there first. How do you build it up? You can't necessarily start with high prices. It doesn't usually work. You got to kind of ramp yourself up, create demand. The more demand, the higher the price, et cetera. It's called demand pricing. The next, next question is from Stacy Best who says, I paint in acrylics, specifically open acrylics. They have built-in drying retardants. And is this a problem in becoming a professional? I observe that most workshops are for oil paints. Does, does this exclude acrylic paint artists? No, no, no. Stacy, I know the product. It's a very good product. I've used it. Uh, it behaves very much like oil paint, and it's good for travel. Uh, because you don't need turpentine. Water-based oils also do the same thing, except they're not acrylic, so you have a choice. But you don't have to have terps that way, right? So there are a ton of very rich, very successful painters who use acrylics. A great painting is a great painting. There are tons of oil painters, but there are also tons of acrylic painters. In the demos that you've seen, maybe on stage at the convention, or maybe in the videos, um, you know, paint... Uh, operates acrylic paint operates very much the same way as oil paint not exactly the same especially something like open acrylics which paints more like oils than traditional acrylics but the techniques you see on video or on stage are pretty close to identical I would say now I've I've used all these products myself and so I have a feel for it but don't get hung up on that I think a great painting you know there are great artists out there who are using acrylics or gouache um, or open acrylics, or a lot of different materials. Uh, watercolors, of course. Uh, some people say watercolors don't sell as well, but you know what? There are some artists out there commanding giant prices for their watercolors. So it has a lot to do with the quality of the painting, plus the brand of the artist, which we just talked about, and that helps get those prices. So just do great paintings and don't get too hung up on it. Yeah. Now, also, you can talk to your gallery. Some galleries might be hung up on it, and they might say, yeah, I'd rather you do oils. But I think if they see great paintings that are going to sell, they're going to say, welcome to my gallery. I hope these marketing ideas are helpful. A reminder that if you want to be considered for the show, The Great Outdoor Painting Challenge, go to plenaircasting.com. And, of course, get your tickets for the Plein Air Convention and the pre-convention workshops at plenairconvention.com. Missing it would be like missing Christmas. You don't want to miss Christmas plenairconvention.com. Also, if you've not seen my blog where I talk about art and life and lots of other things, check it out. It's called Sunday Coffee, and you can find it at coffeewitheric.com. This is always fun. We'll do it again sometime like next week. I'll see you then. My name is Eric Rhodes. I'm the founder and publisher of Plen Air Magazine. Remember, it's a big world out there. Go paint it. Bye-bye. This has been the Plen Air Podcast with Plen Air Magazine's Eric Rhodes. You can help spread the word about Plen Air painting by sharing this podcast with your friends. And you can leave a review or subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week. And you can even reach Eric by email, eric at plenairmagazine.com. Be sure to pick up our free ebook. 240 plein air painting tips by some of America's top painters. It's free at plenairtips.com. Tune in next week for more great interviews. Thanks for listening.